Today, I'm going to answer the question I received the most since I opened this channel. How to get in a PhD program in economics? So first, I'm going to give you the strategy, give you the big picture to help you understand really how to position and how to think about this application. Then I'm going to list all the usual elements you should take care of when you submit an application for a PhD, how important they are, if there are some deal breakers, some necessary condition, if there are something you can do more to differentiate, and so on and so forth. It's very important to understand that the people who will accept you, read your applications, in the end, will be the professors. So during the, this whole process, when you think about writing, when you produce some documents, when you put all this together, you should really think of that you will be, in the end, addressing to a professor who is doing research, who is usually passionate about research, who really wants his department to contribute to the literature. And, and that's really something that your application should reflect from the perspective of the committee of professors who will read your application and potentially accept your application or reject it. You should really think or put yourself in their shoes. What do they want? Well, usually what they want is someone competent who will go until the end of his PhD or her PhD and who will contribute to the literature. So someone who will be pleasant to work with, competent, and who will really contribute to the literature of the department. And all the elements you will put together for the application should go in that direction and make this point very strong. Also, usually it's something you plan a bit in advance. Some of the requirement takes time to prepare and also, there is some kind of networking or really thing you could do, start doing years in advance that will definitely help you a lot. So definitely, if you decide last minute, you will not be done. It just it, it will be optimal to start at least one or two years ahead to really put things together, plant some seeds, network, get experience and really reinforce your application already in advance. So let's now go through the list of all the usual elements that you should provide for an application and that might be important. So the first element will be your grades from your master. And indeed, potentially you haven't finished your master yet. Maybe it's a two years master and you are at the end of the first or the, uh, you have one year and a half already done and you are preparing your application while you're doing your master, but anyway, the grades you have for the first year will be absolutely key. That's typically the deal breaker or the necessary condition. And it might not even reach the committee of professors deciding in the end if the grades are not sufficient. So again, I'm not currently working in a committee to accept PhDs, but I discuss that quite a lot. Uh, with many people who are doing so and from what I observed uh, or heard is that usually a GPA of 5.5 uh, on 6 would be what, what's needed between 5.5 and 6 uh, over 6 to, to get in the program. It seems from those discussions that above 5 you your application might be acceptable and they will go further. Below five, usually you will not, you will be rejected. It will be really a deal breaker. And if your grades are not that high, for example, it's between five and 5.5, .5, I think you can put more effort in the rest to reinforce your application. So this grade will be rather a deal breaker. Either you pass the threshold or not, and then they will go further. And if you feel that you're closer to the 5 and 5.5 over 6, for example, you can just put more effort in the rest or, for example, do a better score at, at other tests like the GRE, but I will speak about that in a minute. So once you pass this threshold, usually the second key element will be to have experience in research. So either you have done some project during your master, during your bachelor thesis, 
uh, either you did some internship and you have some really some research projects that that are very close to what you will do as a PhD your master thesis is usually also key it's really the last thing you present that's very close to what you are going to do in the PhD and it might also for many it will be the first chapter of your PhD thesis so it, it's absolutely clear and again that's why it's it's good to think in advance because that could help a lot with admission that will help a lot even with your phd because if you already have a, an id for your paper yeah, for a first chapter it's very useful so to get experience in research as i said you can do internship you can do research assistantship so becoming an ra for some professor and again this is also something absolutely key because if you are already managed to get uh, an experience with a, a top professor in research she she or he is a, a very good contact an important contact for the rest of this process potentially you you will get a recommendation la letter from uh, her or, or him and and maybe you will even do your phd supervised by this person how to get an RA job well uh, you can contact directly professors, you can look in your, at your new university if there are openings, and you can go on Twitter on RA underscore econ and follow this, this uh, Twitter account to see for all the international applications or job opening for RA positions. You can also do what we call a pre-doc to get experience in research. It's usually a year or a semester where you will get experience do research after your master with a professor within a research teams and this has really two main benefits first you will get experience in research and see if you like that and you want to pursue in that direction second it's a job so you get uh, a good but second it might be you, your door to get a very nice recommendation letter from a top scholar and enter a top program and then of course a phd is highly technical a phd in economics and if your grades are not that high it might be a problem it might be a problem again in the shoes of the professor they might think maybe they will not manage to pass uh, doctoral school so for example in lausanne during the first year you really you go you you have classes with top scholars and really tough exams so you still have to learn to pass exams very quantitative exams doing tons of math and stats uh, micro macro and 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 so it's very important for them to be convinced that you will be able to to pass those exams and doctoral school and not drop after a year and and, and which will be a, a big loss for them so if the grades are not super high but even if they are it, it's usually also something necessary and kind of a necessary condition to have a top score in the GRE for the math part. So you have these international tests uh, who test English and math, uh, the GRE. Uh, that's the test I, I had to pass and everyone had, had to pass uh, at the University of Lausanne, for example. And here, again, I don't have an official number, but I know that the very top score is required. So you should be above at least I would say the 90th percentile so in the top 10 percentile of the distribution uh, again if I'm not mistaken and it might be even higher like uh, uh, in the top 5% to, to increase even more your chances and to show again that you are competent you are able to work hard to do the math and path exams so you will be able to pursue your PhD in the institution and just two words on the GRE for me it just how far, how much time you spend just doing the same uh, exam exercise to prepare again and again for a few months, or I don't know, depending on your level, but it's really just a function of that. Actually, it captures not necessarily very well your competences in math, but rather how much effort are you willing to put to get in this PhD program? And then usually a key element will be a research proposal. So for Lausanne, we had to submit a two page research proposal, which basically explain your research plan, what you suggest to do as a PhD candidate within the department. And this is also key, very important, because 
it will again back in the shoes of the professor it will show if you understand research what are the key elements what are the challenges what's done right now what is the strategies and things cutting edge methods used in research and, and show some maybe that you have some stuff that they don't maybe you have some technical knowledge on something very specific maybe on python that will help you to implement some very fancy math that, that then they think well that person will be fantastic for our team because he will really contribute to the research to the department and and add some knowledge expertise on something we don't have yet so so it has really several uh, use this research proposal first it's very useful for you to define to work on this to get experience on research to define what's your plan on the years to come then it has this use to show that you understand research actually you understand you can cite top scholars the latest paper so you really understand what are the challenges what are the hot topic right now um, so it serves also this role to show them basically to that that you could be a nice colleague you could have a chat and, and understand what's going on right now uh, in research and last, as i said on the other path that was rather citing the, the literature also on your plan you, you you understand you have something to offer to the department and you will contribute to the literature with which again in academia this is everything you have really to understand if you don't know that already that publications are everything in academia that's how you get grants so that's how the department get money so that's how they grow they get uh, recognition worldwide recognition and attract new students new people new good colleagues and, and that's a, a, a positive uh, a virtuous uh, circle, circle then you will require usually two or three recommendation letters and this is also a very key element for many reasons I mean academia has some pros and cons and it's a small world in the end when you are in a field of research everybody knows each other knows the top scholars the top, top papers and if you get a letter from a top scholar it might be it might open a lot of door <laughs> and and allow you to go, to be on the top of the pile of the applications mainly and again here i'm a bit uh, realistic uh, from what I discussed a lot with people over the years, what I perceive in academia is that in top programs, when they receive tons of application, they, they, they will not be able to go to give it to professors and they go through that. You have to manage to get on the pile. And usually it's like when you send a, a publication to a journal, you have some metrics, some really key things that allows you to be on the top of the pile could be coming from a top university, Harvard, MIT, LSC, something that's really famous. Of course, University of Lausanne is a top program worldwide with, with really impressive professors. But it's also a relatively small department and hence it's difficult with the number of publications to be comparable to other departments with 10 times more professors. So if you want to go in a top university in the US, for example, and you are not already from a top university worldwide known, this will be absolutely key. And I think that might be a deal breaker. So it might be the only thing that will get you in those kind of program in MIT or, or really top uh, universities is to have a recommendation letter from a top scholar. And now to get those, well, usually you have to work with them first. You have to have experience. Uh, either they were your, your teacher for some class but rather you work with them as an array and and that's usually how you do that so again if you did a pre-doc with a top scholar you potentially and you did well you will get really important recommendation letter that might be the key to enter a top program but just a disclaimer in my opinion even if you are not in the top 10 programs known given the, the list of the top university and PhD program in the world, I'm not sure it means that it's, it's, uh, it's just different, I think. And there are a lot as well of benefits from not being in, in such a program. 
So usually the things that I've, I've heard from many professors is that if you are in a top program and your supervisor is an outstanding scholar, potentially they will have very little time for you and you will meet them maybe once or twice per year. But if you are potentially with someone who is a little bit less busy and have more time to interact, actually the benefit might be just incredibly high to have such a tight supervision and, and time to exchange and to get knowledge. And, and just, I mean, human contact is, is, is necessary in life. I think we, we all saw that with the lockdown. So I guess PhD staff having a tight contact with your supervisor might be very important and, and worth not going in potentially a, a top program where you will not uh, get those interaction often but that's there is no rules uh, you could be in a top program with a tight relationship I can imagine or in a not so worldwide recognized program and end up not being well supervised so everything exists it's just some trends that I, I, I've heard about and then you have kind of a summary of all that with your CV and motivation letter and here again it will be a reflecting all the elements that I've mentioned. The only advice I, that I have here is again, put yourself in the shoes of a professor and try to think what would be useful given all the things we discussed up to now and from their perspective. I really want to make one last addition and something that every time I was in the process of hiring RAs, TAs, uh, in the committee for hiring professors, something that's always important for me or that was usually kind of a secret weapon is to have something more than the others. We already talk about that uh, with, with Sofia in the podcast. Basically when you send application, potentially hundreds of people send applications. So how can you differentiate? Maybe you have the top grades. Maybe you've done all the things that I've listed well. But then maybe you end up with 20, 50 other people who did the same. So how do you differentiate in the end? Do you have a secret weapon? Something that only very few of the others, if none, have as well. And this could be very varied. I mean, the very pragmatic, down-to-earth things that I could think of is nowadays people with, with background in computer science have definitely disadvantages on some part, but if it's a background and they already prove that they, they, they have the knowledge in economics now and they can reach to a PhD program in economics, having good knowledge in computer science in Python is machine learning with scraping and things like that uh, could be very important. And like the thing that will make you an asset for the department, or if you have very good knowledge with GIS, geographical information system, even if nowadays many people have this in their toolbox. And I'm sure there are other secret weapons in your toolbox that you could use to reinforce your application. So just to give you an example, at the end, I will also explain you what I've done to enter the PhD program in, uh, at the University of Lausanne and share actually my application. I have no clue if it's a good example, to be completely honest. The only thing it's, I was really struggling when I, I wanted to get in and apply to see what was the threshold, what should I do, and so on and so forth. So maybe I'll share some documents, for example, my research proposal, who, who might be very bad, but that's the application I've put at the time and that allowed me to, to pursue with my PhD. I let you judge, hopefully it's useful, and again, I really didn't want to redo it now because I would do it completely differently. I really wanted to keep my application realistic. How did I did that or wrote that, what I was thinking at the time? I hope this has been useful. I'm sure that there is many more things to say and to discuss and to debate. It's just many people ask me this, ask me this question over the time. So this is my answer from my experience, from my perspective, from everything I've heard, discussed and seen over my small academic career so far. I wish you the very best on this path and feel free to comment, to ask me questions and to keep discussing in the comments below.